Okay, do you remember this video where we outlined four different kinds of physics problems? Momentum, energy, dynamics, and kinematics. Okay, so when you look at a problem, can you tell us what's happening with the momentum? Can you tell us what's happening with the energy? Can you recognize the dynamics? And if it's moving, can you tell me what the kinematics are? This is what we've been working on for the last seven weeks. Now we're going to address these with rotation. So we have angular momentum, and you better conserve it, just like you do with linear momentum. The energy is exactly the same as it was. Work is equal to the change of energies, but we have a new kind of energy, rotational kinetic energy, because when things are rotating, they have movement. We have dynamics, where force provides acceleration when you push something. Now we have rotational dynamics, where when you try to turn something, it begins spinning. And lastly, we have kinematics, where rather than things moving forward or upward, they rotate. For example, you remember in the video, the total system still has the same amount of momentum, but in the beginning, it's all in the red cart, and at the end, it's the two carts together. We have to conserve momentum, and we have a, a small cart moving quickly, and it hits a large cart, and they move very slowly together. Why? Because the momentum is the same, and the mass got very big, and if the momentum is conserved, the velocity must drop. Likewise, if something is rotating, it has angular momentum. And if it has a collision with another body, like me, I should still be spinning. Wait, what if I allow myself to spin by getting in this chair, hopefully not killing myself? So if we can have a collision, all of that angular momentum will go into my body. And now we're one, like the two masses were one. So we write angular momentum as a small l. And the sum of the change of the angular momentum, as long as there's no outside turning forces called torques, the change is going to be zero. Where momentum is mass times velocity, angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia times omega. So momentum, mass times velocity, can be thought of as how hard it is to stop something from moving. Angular momentum can be thought of how hard it is to stop something from turning. If it has a lot of speed, spinning-wise, or if it has a large moment of inertia. For linear motion, inertia is just mass. But for angular motion, the moment of inertia is mass and radius, how big it is, which we'll talk about in a moment. So all the laws of conservation of energy hold. We just add another form of energy called rotational energy. So you can see, if I did work on this, I put in force times distance, there was work done on that. Now there's objects moving very fast in there. There's kinetic energy there. So I have rotational kinetic energy. I can turn that into heat energy in my hand with friction. The transformation of energy from one form to the other is the same. We just have another kind called rotational kinetic energy. Instead of one half mv squared, it's one half i omega squared. Again, omega is the rate at which it's spinning, and i is this moment of inertia. And now we can see why i has to have r in it. Because if a mass is rotating around a point, at some rate, one, two, three, it's going much slower now than if it were out here going around one, two, three. So for now, until we talk about it more, we can think of the moment of inertia as the mass times the square of the radius. And again, the work that I put in this by pulling it turns into kinetic energy in the rotation. But because the thing's not going anywhere, these can be used as energy storage devices. They call them a flywheel. This is what you put in a lot of motors in order to keep them moving smoothly so they don't just stop all of a sudden if you hit a bump. We can look at other transitions. I can give this some rotational energy. I can give this rotational energy. And we can see that rotational energy change into gravitational potential energy. 
and change back to rotational energy. Okay, so for dynamics, you know that if you push something, if you put a force on it, it's going to accelerate. And the same is true rotationally, but we don't call it a force because it's not just any force that will make this rotate. I can push on it like this, I can pull on it like this. We need a perpendicular force and we need it to be away from the axis. And then we call it a torque. If I apply a torque to this, if I apply a torque to this, it will rotationally accelerate faster and faster and faster. No torques, we have no acceleration. We have constant angular velocity turning around. So we would write torque is with like a Greek T is equal to the moment of inertia times alpha, where alpha is the angular acceleration, how it's speeding up rotationally. And lastly, we have kinematics. Velocity, how fast something is moving, is the rate of change of displacement. And so what we have is omega, how fast something's rotating, is equal to the change in angle over change in time, or the time rate of change of theta. We're used to thinking of angle in terms of degrees. So we might say this is moving at maybe 60 degrees a second right now. Or if it goes all the way around in one second, that would be 360 degrees a second. But we are going to talk about displacements in terms of radians. Measuring an angle in radians is just the ratio of this curve here, length L, to the radius. So theta is equal to L over R. If this length is the same as that radius, that's one radian. How do we convert this to degrees? Oh, well I know if I go all the way around it's 360 degrees, and that length is 2 pi times the radius. So 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. So what is the unit for radians, it's a ratio, it's meters over meters, and so there's no units. But sometimes you have to say radians so they know. I can displace this wheel, one radian about, that, that would be, if this is a radius, that length is about this long. So I can displace this wheel, one radian. And if I have a time rate of change of one radian per second, it would be like one, two, three, four, oops, that's too fast, right? Because it has to go all the way around in two pi. That's pi is 3.14159. Two times that is about 6.3, right? So we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, six point three. There you go. So that's about one radian per second. It's about the rotation of one radian per second. Or I could rotate it in, I could rotate it in this direction at one radian per second. I could also displace my wheel by one radian in this direction. I've rotated it this way. And if I were to rotate it with omega equals run one radian per second, that way it would look like this. One, two, three, four. Five, six, about 6.3. And so let's move at about six radians per second, one, yeah, about one revolution per second. And we can see there's no change in that angular velocity, in its omega. But if I slow it down, then I'm changing it. I'm doing it by adding a torque. We can define alpha as the change of omega over change in time, or d omega dt. And if we substitute this in, it's the second time derivative of theta. So it's the acceleration of the angle. So for instance, if I put a steady torque on this, in this direction, what's going to happen is it will slowly accelerate, increasing the angular velocity faster and faster. Now I can switch the direction of the torque, 
turn it this way, and then the angular acceleration is in the opposite direction, slowing it, turning it around, and accelerating in the other direction. So what links three of these is this moment of inertia. This mass of the object, it's the moment of inertia of the object. It's the mass of the object times the radius squared, how far it is from the center. This can be thought of as how hard it is to get something to start turning or how hard it is to stop it from turning once it's turning. And so the angular momentum is this moment of inertia times how fast it's spinning. That's how hard it is to stop it. Its rotational energy is the square of how fast it's spinning times this term of how hard it is to get it up there, how much work you have to put in, or how hard it is to stop it once it's going. And lastly, the torque. If I want to rotationally accelerate something that's very small with a low mass and a very small radius, I need very little torque. If I want to rotationally accelerate something that's big with a large radius and a lot of mass, I need to apply a lot more torque to it. So to sum it up, we now have angular momentum, which can be thought of as how hard it is to stop something from rotating. The amount of angular momentum you have in the system is conserved. If one thing loses angular momentum, like that wheel lost angular momentum to me, I gained angular momentum. The energy equations are the same, but now we have an extra term of rotational kinetic energy that can be held in a rotating object. And of course it's kinetic energy. All the little particles of that wheel are moving fast. And then if you want to rotationally accelerate something, you need to apply a torque. And lastly, all the kinematic equations that we use linearly, we have analogous equations for rotational motion. So if velocity is the derivative of displacement, angular velocity is the derivative of angular displacement, or theta. And if acceleration is the derivative of velocity, then alpha, angular acceleration, is a derivative of angular velocity, which is the second derivative of displacement.